Hi everyone and a massive welcome back to World Ocean Day or, or maybe we should call it World Ocean Week. Now there are a huge amount of fantastic education opportunities on the World Ocean Day for Schools website. That's worldoceanday.school and today is all about plastic and plastic pollution and what we can all do about it. Now it's hosted by Common Seas and we're delighted also on the Encounter EDU website to host a vast array of lessons and activities designed with them. But today we are delighted to welcome Sid and we'll be joining her soon. We'll be speaking about the Sea Monkey Project all the way to Nang Island in Malaysia. It's going to be fantastic talk. I'm really looking forward to hearing her story. But before we get there, just a few added points. So if you are watching this, you'll see to the side of the screen, there is a Q&A app, an interaction app. Now that's where you can put all your questions for Sid and we'll come to those after her talk. If you want to have the screen full at the front of the classroom, it's really easy for an uh, adult who's supporting the learning just to access the same live lesson, keep it on mute maybe, uh, on a mobile, and you can use the interaction app on a mobile and have the lesson full screen. If you do have any problems and you need to contact support during the live lesson, you can click on the speak bubble, and that's down at the bottom right of every page on the Encounter EDU website. But without further ado, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome Sid all the way from Malaysia on board the Sea Monkey. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, Sid. Good evening, even. Hello, good evening, Jamie. How's it going? It's brilliant. It's so great to have you uh, with us today. And I believe you've, you've got a fantastic talk for us all about um, the Sea Monkey Project and your adventures both on the seas and in looking at making them healthier for the future. Yep, and I cannot wait to share it with you guys. <laughs> well, I will let you take it away. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. <laughs> All right, cool. So, um, hello everybody. My name is Sydney Steenland. I am 16 years old and I'm going to talk to you guys about the Sea Monkey Project and uh, my family and I, we've got some pretty whack stories around um, and I hope you guys enjoy. Um, can we pull up my slides if they're there? All right, so we're ready. So uh, who are the Sea Monkeys? So the Sea Monkeys, we are a family of four. There is um, my mom, my dad and my brother and I. So my mum is the cartoonist. She will be doing the illustrations throughout the, the, the presentation. And there is my dad. He is the skipper of the project. He, um, yeah, he's the skipper of the boat as well. And there's my brother, the video filmmaker. He um, makes our little videos here and there um, that, you know, I have to be in. <laughs> and then there's me, the speaker and educator. So one fun fact about us is um, for the past decade now, since 2011, my family and I have been living on the Sea Monkey. So the Sea Monkey is our boat. It's been our home for the, as I said, the past 10 years. It is a 41 foot long sailing yacht. And um, yeah, it's been amazing. But anyway, where have we been? So uh, we started from Brisbane, Australia. We moved on our boat when I was just six years old and my brother was three. So my brother's three years younger than me. And you know, we were born in Brisbane, Australia. We moved on our boat from this massive house we used to have and a big business. Um, that all went away for complicated reasons. And we moved on to our boat. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, so we moved on to our boat and we started sailing up the east coast of Australia, up the Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest living organism. Now that was an experience. And we started sailing through Southeast Asia, so Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, we've done land trips here and there. 
to like Myanmar and Cambodia, all sorts of places. Um, but one thing we found reoccurring everywhere we went, doesn't matter where or how far away from the sea we were, we found plastic. We found plastic in the Great Barrier Reef. We found it in Malaysia. We found it in Indonesia and Thailand. It doesn't matter where we went. We saw plastic pollution and it was so devastating to see how uh, deep this issue affects every uh, sea creature, every, not every, but most uh, land creatures and uh, every single human being on earth. So I'll explain a bit about how um, plastic pollution affects human beings. It might scare you a bit, but that's a good thing. <laughs> and then we'll get into the good stuff later. So if you look at this map here of the five gyres, if you see uh, this map of the world, we have big circles in the ocean. So what these big circles are is they are called five gyres. What the five gyres are is they're actually just massive whirlpools of a concentration of plastic. So what happens is when the winds of the winds of the equator, I don't know the specific name, but there's these winds that blow across the equator and there are these ocean currents that go around the ocean. And these winds move the sea and the ocean currents, you know, move the plastic and everything ends up in this, that's just how the ocean go, all the plastic ends up in these concentrations. And they, they can stay there or they can flow, float out, but they are just a massive collection of plastic. So what there is, is if you look at the, the one in the middle at the top, so that is uh, in between Japan and America, it's the big one at the top, uh, that is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is the world's largest concentration of trash. It is twice the size of the American state of Texas. And but what people think of it is they think they imagine the five gyre, the, not the five gyre, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch as a massive island of plastic. So this island, um, it isn't actually an island. It has never been an island. Um, what people don't seem to know about it is it is actually, I'm pretty sure, um, from my memory of this number, it's very close, if not accurate, it is 93% microplastics. So microplastics, I'm going to explain what microplastics are, and this is the worst part of plastic pollution, if you ask me. So on the next slide, you will see... This river, you see, this is what how microplastics are made. So microplastics, uh, when trash flows into the oceans, you know, from the rivers or from boats dumping it into the sea, uh, you have the UV rays, uh, you know, beating down on it, and from the constant movement of the ocean and it rubbing against things, these the plastic will eventually, like all things, break down into tinier particles. But when it breaks down, it isn't fully gone. What it is, is it just turns down into tinier versions of plastic that never really go away. It just gets smaller and smaller. But usually microplastics are smaller than we can see. And the reason why they are more dangerous is because, now this is going to get a bit weird, I am going to become a fish for a moment. So just pretend that I am Sydney the fish. Um, okay, so Sydney the fish, I am in the sea and I am swimming around in the ocean, the great blue sea. And I'm looking for my food, I'm a hungry little fish. And I look and I see this little speck of red, whatever it is. I see this little red speck or orange, whatever, out in the ocean. And I'm like, huh, that little speck, that colorful speck looks like my food because it looks like krill or algae. So I swim up to it. And I Sydney the fish, I swim up to it and I go and smell it. So one fact about um, plastic is that it isn't inherently toxic itself, I guess. Like it is toxic, but, um, oh no, this is a different fact, sorry. Um, so basically what happens is there is a uh, component in plastic that actually attracts algae. And when it attracts algae, it you know, sticks to the plastic. And algae is the scent of fish's food. 
So when this plastic is, has algae stuck to it, Sydney the fish has gone up to it and I've smelt that little colorful speck that looks like my food and it smells like my food. I'm like, dang, I'm a fish. I'm not that smart. It must be my food. <laughs> so I swim up to it and I eat it. And I'm like, dang, that was not very tasty because it's plastic. But anyway, so now I'm Sydney the human now. But the little fish that was me um, has eaten the microplastic. So fish and, well, not just fish, all sea creatures really in some way or another eat plastic. But when they eat microplastic, it will go into their stomach and, you know, they can't digest it properly. So it will just keep gathering up in their stomach and they will eventually think that they're full when they're, they're really not they're actually starving, but their stomach says that they're full. And, you know, their acids in their stomach will dissolve um, the plastic a little bit and leach toxic chemicals into the fish's uh, meat. So that happens to all creatures, including human beings. And I will get to the human being part later on. But what happens, so that, that that's what happens. So then on the next slide, you will see that when the little fish eat the microplastic, the little fish eat that, and then the bigger fish eat the micro eat the little fish and more microplastics, and then humans end up eating the bigger fish. The bigger fish, um, you know, they're toxic, and when humans eat that, you know, we also get toxic chemicals into our body as well, and little bits of microplastics. So studies in the United Kingdom from 2019 showed that humans are eating, like ingesting up to five grams of microplastics per week. And that is about a credit card's worth of plastic. That is too much plastic for my liking to be eating. And we don't eat nearly as much as what all the sea creatures do. So when humans eat microplastic, um, you know, with the toxic chemicals leaching into our body, it can lead to complications such as um, it can form cancer. It leads to some sort of cancer. It can lead to um, issues in how women reproduce. And uh, some people, some scientists have found microplastics inside the womb of unborn babies. Yes, that is not nice. It is horrible. So, yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, there is Hawaii. Hawaii is right on the outskirts of it and you'd think that you know everyone thinks of Hawaii like wow like I've, I've been to Hawaii and I thought like wow Hawaii it's like pristine beaches all day every day it's going to be awesome I went there and on this picture of the beach I, that I took myself it was actually this is the one of the biggest beaches in uh, Oahu the main island it was covered in microplastics because it gets all the outskirts of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So that is what the beach in Hawaii looked like, and it's just covered in these microplastics. And then on the next picture, you'll see um, it, that's how the plastic breaks up. It forms, it, you know, it just slowly, like in Avengers Infinity War, they flake away, but not fully gone, not fully gone. So um, another thing with microplastics is, uh, you know, they will go and they're mixed up with sand and uh, turn into what people call beach confetti. And it's so hard to clean off the beaches, like, you know, from a regular beach thing. It is so hard. Mixes with the sand, it's hard to get the sand out. Um, but yeah, and then on the next picture that is related to, um, you remember I said how um, there's a, there's, when you go on a beach and there's lots of microplastic, you'll see like in this picture, there's not a lot of red or yellow or bright colors. There's a lot of blue and white and black, like in this picture. Um, and that is because, um, sorry, that is because, <laughs> sorry, that is because um, all the bright pieces have probably been eaten up by another animal because, you know, they look like their food and all the blue pieces, they blend in with the environment. Anyway, so essentially, um, our ocean is turning into a plastic soup and it is awful. That's what we've seen, um, my family and I, everywhere that we've traveled. So my family and I, we thought, what can we do about this? Um, this the ocean has been our home all our lives, our playground. Um, my 
greatest teacher and um, our life source. Like it's everyone's problem. Honestly, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. It doesn't matter how far away from the sea you are. You, your life depends on the ocean to live. Um, oxygen, water, food, life itself is the ocean pretty much. <laughs> so my family and I, we thought, what can we do to solve this problem? So the first thing that my, my, my dad and I, so mostly my dad came up with because I was like 11 at the time. Uh, we started, we thought we'd build these plastic recycling machines. We went through a few different ideas and we came to the precious plastic recycling machines that were invented by a man in Holland. So we took the blueprints that were open source and we just, we tried to, uh, pioneering in them to make them smaller, more compact and sustainable and portable because we had this dream that we want to we want to distribute these machines all over Southeast Asia so that we can teach the locals how to recycle, not only so they can clean up their environment, but also so they can actually build a livelihood for themselves and feed their families because plastic pollution uh, greatly affects their fishing industry. And that is what a lot of these villages we are talking about rely on. So we started building these machines and they are a three-in-one recycling machine. So when I say three in one, there's three separate components. There is first the shredding machine. And the shredder machine, what you do is you get your clean sort of plastic because there's seven different types of plastic out there. And um, we need to sort them into types so they don't get contaminated and also colors. You put the plastic into the shredder, it comes out as these little flakes. And then we put the flakes into either, either the extrusion machine or the injection machine. And the injection machine, uh, we use that one the most. What you do is you put it into a hopper. And you put it into this bright turquoise hopper, uh, the funnel. It'll go in this tube, it'll melt, and we will inject it into a mold. And the mold will come out into anything we want, really. We, we can get as creative as we want with all the molds to build plastic products. Then the extrusion machine, it's, it's the same thing really, except when it goes into the hopper and it gets melted, it goes, um, it comes out the end as a, like a noodle and we can use like, like frozen yogurt style, um, Mr. Whippy it around a mold to make like a bowl or something. So you can get really creative with these machines. So when we have these machines, our goal is we recycle plastic waste, something that is valued at nothing in a lot of places or five, 20 cents, we will recycle, we recycle it into an item of higher value. And these items can be anything. We have, we've made uh, coasters and pegs. We've made uh, rulers for schools. We've made uh, these, one, these uh, it's our best product, our best selling product, our most popular. These uh, recycled plastic turtle pendant necklaces and uh, yep, that's the coasters again. And we have got, with these machines, uh, we've made such amazing things. We've gotten to work with so many big brands like The Body Shop. Uh, we work with Body Shop Malaysia and soon I think it's branching out into a Body Shop Vietnam or I can't remember. We make uh, all different products for them. And we've also before worked with Adidas. In, I don't know if you guys say Adidas or whatever, but I say Adidas, <laughs> but yeah. So we made uh, coasters for a Adidas Parley run for the oceans fun run. That was, that was a really cool event. So yeah, with our dream of building those little cottage industries, we have managed to, to this day, we have achieved that uh, goal in a few different places here and there, but we have shipped over 35 machines worldwide. So there is one, um, our very first machine actually went to Jersey, um, which I think is where World Oceans Day for Schools is based. I'm not hundred percent sure, but yeah, we, our very first machine went there. Um, but with the cottage industries, we have um, machines. We have, we have one machine, for example, the type of place in this little kampong, which is um, Malay for like a little village. Um, is. Oh, I didn't tell you where I am at the moment. <laughs> I forgot. Okay, um, just a little update. I'm. We are currently in um, Malaysia. 
in Southeast Asia on Penang Island. I'm on my boat right now. <laughs> anyway, sorry about that. So yeah, with the cottage industries, we have a few here in Malaysia. One is run entirely by uh, mothers of the, um, the indigenous people here uh, so that they can uh, provide, their provide for their families and empower the women of the villages. And that is a very proud project of us. Uh, so then we don't just recycle plastic waste because like the fishing industry in the ocean, um, fishing nets actually make up something like 30 to 40% of the actual plastic pollution issue. And that is such a hard issue to try and tackle because you have these bits of plastic, these nets, they probably have bycatch in them, like bits of fish and turtle and gross bits and pieces and growth all sorts of stuff and um they're all different types of plastic sometimes like we cannot identify what type of plastic fishing nets are because they don't have a stamp on them like bottles do but we have managed to find uh, certain little techniques to find out what type they are so we don't contaminate the plastic and um we don't even have to melt these things melt fishing nets down sometimes but what I'm trying to say is um, my family and I, we thought we need to do something as well about fishing nets. So we got the fishing nets. We collected them ourselves. Um, my dad and I, we first went out, picked some off the rocks, and then my whole family got involved. And then we brought our whole um, project uh, employees on board, and we were all collecting fishing nets. And we made, last year, 2020, we made our very first 100% upcycled material apparel. We made backpacks, tote bags, and uh, fanny packs, I mean, or bum bags. Australians call them bum bags, but yeah, it's weird. So from the, in these, um, these bags, what we did is we got, we got sail from boats, we got sail from kite surfers, we got seat belts and fishing net and plastic and little bits of rope and we got all sorts of things and we managed to tailor them all together into a product that works together harmoniously. And uh, yeah, we, we recycled plastic into little toggles and pendants and we stitched the net on as a, as a um, what do you call it, as a pocket. And even the stitching of the bag is 100% recycled plastic bottles. So it's 100% upcycled. We're very proud of these products and we're still manufacturing them and we're getting a little bit snazzy with them now. We've also developed wallets recently, but I haven't got a picture of them in here. But anyway, so at the end of everything, like like my family and I, we realized that, you know, you cannot just change the world from recycling. That is not the answer to this pressing issue. We, we just, we thought like at the end of everything we do, we conduct ocean plastic awareness education so no matter what we do we always make sure we get our point across about saving the oceans from plastic so back before um the lovely lovely covid situation we used to do um we used to conduct waste education workshops so yeah we take our machine to schools and malls and events and we would teach these kids or anyone who walked in how to recycle. So not only could they appreciate the process of recycling and so that they don't use more plastic, uh, they also got to make their own recycled plastic turtle necklace at the end. And that was very fun. And yeah, we, we love teaching them. We miss it too. But yeah, but then, you know, we can't teach everyone in person because that's just unre that's just not realistic. We cannot teach everyone direct like I'm talking to you guys right now. Uh, what we also do, my mom, my amazing mom, she has com she compiled and illustrated um, our plastic education comic book. So we have it available on our website for free download, or you can buy it as recycled paper printable. Uh, we have used these comic books to educate kids and adults of all ages, like, as young as six years old for me. <laughs> Um, you know, about the plastic issue and my family, me and my family's story. And yeah, it's a fun little coloring in adventure. You can go check it out on our website if you want. 
and yeah we have we have a lot of kids all around the world who have uh, sent us pictures of their comic book and they they have so much fun and it great gives us great uh gratification i guess you know to see that they enjoy it <clears throat> but yeah so what can people do as an individual to change the world so that's you know that's why we're here right um, what can I do as an individual to start making change? Well, what I would say, um, I've been doing conservation activism for six years now. And what I always say to people is just start doing something. It doesn't matter what you do. You just got to start doing something, something so small that it will grow into something bigger. You know, I will get a little bit cheesy here, but like George Harrison George Harrison, uh, what, like he said, from small little things, big things grow. I believe that. Because um, what I started doing originally, uh, before, before we ended up building this business, um, it's not a very big business, but, you know, it's a business that we use to fight plastic pollution and, um, you know, pay people in less fortunate situations to recycle plastic. What we started doing was we just started doing new, little YouTube videos. Now, my brother and I, we were tiny, tiny little kids. We even started when I was maybe eight years old. We would do education videos, and then it slowly progressed into plastic pollution videos and updates on um, the, the efforts we've made. And we're like, yeah, we want to take this to the next step. So we started, um, you know, then we started our business. So... Yeah, I mean, you don't have to just do, you know, you don't have to do YouTube videos because not everyone likes being in front of a camera or editing videos. It's a nightmare editing videos. Um, but what you can do is every single person as an individual, you are a consumer. Consumers have a lot of power. Like you may not believe it, but it's true. Consumers, um, individuals have so much power. What you can do in your everyday life is just... You have the power to ask for an alternative to the plastic. You can ask, um, you don't need to have a coffee cup or juice cup, whatever. You can say, I have my reusable cup here, like maybe a Starbucks cup. You know, we use our Starbucks cups all the time. Um, but you don't have to stop there. You can say, I don't need a plastic bag. I have my tote bag or I don't need a straw. I have my reusable straw and, you know, all different Anything you can think of, really. You can just think, what you can do in your everyday life is follow the five R's. So I, I love this cartoon. It's so cute and it's, it's so versatile. So here we have the five R's. You can refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and rot. Um, yep, that's pretty self-explanatory. You can take a screenshot if you want to keep for um, later use. But... What you can do is just think before you buy. Like, just imagine supporting these grumpy big companies. I don't like that idea. That's what like, that's sort of what gives me the strength. But also because I don't want my plastic because I don't know where my plastic will end up even if I put it in the rubbish bin. I just think I don't want it to go into the ocean just in case. Like, I have my little reusable water bottle here. And I didn't grab it, but I have a real handy little um, alternative, you know, plastic alternative kit with, you know, knife, fork, spoon, straws, everything really, chopsticks. And yeah, you can just think, can I buy this better? Can I buy this from a local market? Can I buy it handmade? Can I buy without plastic? Can I buy it organic? Can you do things better rather than take the easy way out? So, you know, you've probably been told all this before, like, you know, oh, you know, refuse straws, you save the turtles and stuff. But honestly, it is true. Like, I have like this little anxiety looming back in my mind every single day on um, how I can, you know, reduce plastic every day because it gives me anxiety. <laughs> but yeah. So, you know, when, when you start doing little things, you can think, you know, you, as you start doing things, you learn more, you become more curious and, you know, you end up growing your actions. So, and then you maybe, maybe who knows, maybe you'll end up having like a business like my family and I do, or have your own little local organization, or you might end up running for politics. Who knows? Who cares? Just do something that, you know, 
actually makes a difference and do something that makes you happy. You can, I will say, find your superpower in making a change. Like my superpower, as you can probably tell, is talking. <laughs> I, I, I can talk for a long time. I, I like to talk and I can use that in so many situations. Like I'm talking to you guys. I can make videos. I can talk um, to random people on the street. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you're an artist, like my mom, like if you're an artist, you have this amazing power. Like my all these cartoons throughout the speech from my mom, that's her using her superpower to change the world. But yeah. Um, and the reason why we do this is because, you know, plastic is forever. In a thousand years when, you know, maybe humanity has gone extinct at the rate we're going, who knows? But, you know, we're trying to change that, right? That's the whole reason why we're here today. But, you know, when we're all gone, plastic is going to be sitting there laughing at us like, ha-ha, we're immortal, sucker. And it's not going to go away in any shape or form. So, yeah, that is my advice. That is my story. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you for watching. I hope I didn't bore you, but yeah. Sid, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so, so much. And, and a lovely uh, encouragement at the end for everyone to find their superpower. Um, so absolutely brilliant. Um, and, and what I, you know, found very impactful at the beginning talking about, you know, the microplastics, the breaking down the small particles and how those become more available for smaller animals um, in our ocean, how that can cause physical damage, and then how the whole, in fact, plastic industry is reliant on so many chemicals beyond the actual plastic, the plasticizers, the colorants, the flame retardants, all these different things, and, and how it isn't just a physical plastic problem, but also the chemical plastic problem um, that we need we need to think about. So, Absolutely fantastic. And then I just you know, love the, the upcycling, the reuse, going into the refuse bit. Really, really lovely. And and very, very important. We have some questions, if that's okay. Absolutely. Let me just plug my headphones so I can hear better. <laughs> no problem. All right, let's go. Brilliant. Uh, so the first question um, is, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's from Mrs. Ashmore's uh, 5A class. Um, and they're wondering, actually, would there, could there be any negative side effects on sea animals by carrying out this project? Huge amounts of positive uh, impacts, which you described brilliantly, but they're just interested if there's any... I think we've probably heard about a lot of projects that have unintended consequences um, in, in the news. And so I think they're just interested in, in, in that angle. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. Well, so we have had our um, our little, oh my God, we actually did that moments, you know, uh, like back when I said we used to do workshops, we would make, um, you know, plastic recycled uh, turtles. And um, the, th the issue with that was there was a lot of off cuts and it would turn into dust. And that I'm just looking back at it like that was dumb <laughs> um because the way you cut it off it turns into dust so um and it, it all mixes up and it goes everywhere we don't know where it goes but we we try our best to do it in a most more controlled environment and but you know sometimes we cannot help help it the wind will blow and take some away we realized this we're like okay this is not good uh we have now actually in development and also we some of our more recent molds that wasn't just turtles we have developed new molds so that it has no um, extra excess around it. And uh, our new turtle mold that's coming, it will have no excess. So it'll just come out looking lovely. And uh, we don't have to, you know, be idiots like that. But also the machines, um, every now and then you'll have some, um, you know, sort of, not, not smoke, but fumes come out because when you melt plastic, it doesn't matter how you do it it's going to turn into, you know, it's going to have fumes, but, you know, sometimes we can have it under control a lot of the time. We have like, you know, proper vent ventilation, 
but you know it, it does end up in the environment but we're trying to offset this by also planting mangroves in Myanmar I think or Thailand I think it's Myanmar we're doing uh, programs I think in the future where we're going to be planting mangroves and with our every bag that we sell and uh you know if you melt something at a high enough temperature it won't turn into fumes but you know everyone's safe and uh, we're trying our best to offset um what we do uh, create even though it doesn't matter what you do it's going to have an impact but we hope we can minimize it as much as possible uh, really interesting to see that you know when the intention right intention is there you will always start to refine to try and reduce um any unintended consequences fantastic and in fact a question from oscar was there on, on on the melting of plastic and releasing gases so oscar hope, hopefully that's oh. a question um too yeah um so we have uh from oak class at Freshfield primary would love to know how many products have you designed from you listed some of them but it seems to be a growing list well i don't think i can answer that properly <laughs> because i i'm not I, I used to be very involved in the machine, um, you know, plastic manufacturing, but now I'm more into the education side and I don't, I know what happens over there, but I, I can't be bothered to ask sometimes. But there's um, circles, there's yep. bum bags, there's... Yes. Rulers. So we have pegs, coasters, we make combs, keychains, uh, backpacks, hip bags, backpack, um, what do you call it? Tote bags. Um, do they make the eternal necklaces, coasters? I think I said that. I don't know if I said that. Um, uh, and I could ask my dad, but he's back downstairs head, head, head and he's also the watching. Head project website and you'll see. Yes, there you go. Head to the oh, project website. We're, we're now making doorknobs out of plastic bags. Like that is cool. And, you know, random bits and pieces here and there. <laughs> so um, many things in development. Brilliant, brilliant. There's a question come through from Bo, um, who's asking, how did you manage to come up with such an amazing machine? And just also said, this is you, you're brilliant and thank you and well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> you too. <laughs> um, so, well, our machines, uh, we didn't, as I said, we didn't invent them. Uh, we just sort of pioneered in them. So the machines, uh, as I said, they're three separate components. Uh, they were all originally completely separate and, you know, flimsy, floppy, you know, hard to transport. And we were like, we need to make this more portable, and easy to use. Um, so we got the blueprints off the Precious Plastic uh, website. We built them, had a few little uh, accidents with the electrical here and there because, you know, exploration, am I right? Uh, and we managed to put them all into one table with wheels we can wheel these machines around. That's how portable they are. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, you listed you listed a number of actions um, that young people could take, whether it's as a consumer, um, whether it's as an advocate, um, whether that's through education or getting their school to change or their local supermarket to change or shops to change or companies. If you could do one, number one thing young people around the world could do to tackle ocean plastic pollution, could you pick one? Hmm. I don't know. I, I'll have to think about that. But like, it's hard because everyone has different situations. And like, I, I cannot go into my school and say, hey, we need to stop using plastic because I don't go to school. <laughs> I'm homeschooled. Um, but I would say, talk to everyone, you know, start telling people be in their face if you have to saying this is why it's bad and this is what you can do about it because if, even if it's for selfish reasons like oh do you want to die do you, do you want to die <laughs> it can be a bit dramatic like that but you, you know you have to be dramatic sometimes and um yeah you can just talk to people talk to your family your friends you know get the word out and start making actions even in your own home and then you can start getting into companies and governments and stuff you know feel like that but i'd say just start just start talking and educating people around you that's absolutely fantastic i know that common seas who are hosting this day have a suite of activities that you can do at home um, to educate yourself more as as, as um sid, sid was mentioning there um the next question is it, it's from uh, class 4a and they're in alderman's green coventry 
Um, and, and they're asking, how would you like us to help support you and your project from where they live? That would be amazing. Um, well, what you could do, you could check out our website and our social medias, anything you want. But we have a lot of products, um, really cool products, if I do say so myself, up for sale on our website. <clears throat> and, you know, every time, you know, you buy one, like a bag, you're going to be planting a mangrove in Myanmar and you know, all the money will go to us so we can continue educating um, schools, put machines in places. You know, it, it's, a, it's not sketchy. We, we, we try and make it as transparent as possible. It'll go directly into making a difference. And I, I think you can donate, but we also have uh, like school uh not fundraising, but we have school programs. Uh, I, I don't know too much about it because I'm sort of in like, I'm just beginning to get involved in it. Um, but I'm making videos for people in schools to um, get a subscription for. And, you know, you can start fundraising in your school and get programs, do all sorts of fun things uh, under the CMAC project. And, you know, the donations will come to us. So it might be a fun thing for your school to do. And you can ask us about that um, in our email on our website yeah <laughs> that'd be cool brilliant so all the men's green either get in contact direct um with the sea monkey project or we're very happy to facilitate that if you just drop a note uh using the support button on the website and we, we can pop all the all the details through and and get 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 you in the class i'm engaged and that goes for for all the classes watching very happy to connect you um to sid and the fantastic sea monkey team um, from uh, this next question is from Dunblane, Queen Victoria School, um, and they would like to know where do you see the future of the project? What's next? Hmm, that is a tricky one. So I, I don't, I can't really like. It's hard for me to answer this because we nobody predicted COVID back in 2000, 2019. We were at full speed ahead. You know, we were doing events and talks, and you know talking to schools and companies it was insane and then everything stopped like the world stopped and we were we put into like survival mode and you know we did it, other events and things so you know it completely changed so I'm not 100% sure but we do have um uh I think I, I should be able to talk about it we, we we're beginning a new uh company uh you can search it up if you want. I think the website is ready. I don't care as long as you guys know about it. Uh, it's called Loop to Cycle. And it is going to be the, the parent company of the Sea Monkey Project. So it'll handle like the business side while the Sea Monkey Project can continue just going hot forward basically with, um, you know, education programs and, you know, getting, act not, not activism, but more conservation, you know, maybe maybe buying mangrove land to to protect um you know all sorts of wacky stuff like that <laughs> it'll be pretty cool that i would like to make more videos available for the public on education that's actually fantastic i love that sort of like head head heart and probably hands approach across the, the different yeah. things and, and if you don't know about the importance of mangroves and you're watching this live lesson, please do um, take the opportunity to find out what amazing and important habitats um, they are. We, we have time for, for just one last question. Um, this is again from Oak Class and Thrushfield uh, Primary. And the question is, if everybody started to act now, do you think we can turn the problems we have around? A message of perhaps hope uh, for the end. Well, I'm a very... Uh, I wouldn't say optimistic, but more a realistic person. And I, I would say, yes, like it sounds, you have to be optimistic at time, like all the time, really, not all the time, but you have to be optimistic most of the time. And I believe, you know, everyone starts making a difference. Everyone just starts now, then it's going to affect everything else. And, you know, the world is like messed up in so many different ways, but that's when everyone starts doing something about it. We can not, maybe not reverse, it'll be hard to reverse, but curb it into a better lane on this highway of life. Oh, that was cheesy. But yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, it'll be good. Um, yes, I believe everyone can do it. 
Well, so thank you so, so much um, for your talk and a massive virtual round of applause from all those classes watching. I know there'll be applause which you can't see, um, but it's definitely coming your way from around the world uh, for a really inspiring talk. Uh, for classes watching, don't forget on the worldoceanday.school website, there are more activities, videos and other ways to get involved in tackling the plastic pollution issue on land and in the sea, and also on the EncounterEDU.com website. Um, there's a host of lesson plans, activities, and don't forget, of course, to drop in on the Sea Monkey Project website and all their social channels. Um, but uh, without further ado, Sid, so just say thank you so much again, and it's a goodbye from this live lesson, and thank you to all the classes who have been watching. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. See you. <laughs>